If you would turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We just began our journey through the Gospel of Matthew last Sunday. And so today we're going to be in verse 18 to verse 25. It's just eight verses and it's very familiar. And as I cautioned this last week, I want to make sure we don't allow the familiar to uh, cause us to kind of check out, disengage, and not really pay attention to what God is saying to us because there's some great things here in this, in this passage, even though it's brief and even though it is familiar and even though it is a week before Christmas. So everything's kind of coming together to, um, to possibly tempt us to not really dial in to what God has to say to us today. So as you found your place there, I just want to introduce this scripture, even though, like I said, it is familiar. It happens every year. There always seems to be a conversation about Christmas and its true meaning, right? There's always um, almost this, uh, this battle going on between Christianity and the culture and there's, there's two sides and people saying, no, we need to say Merry Christmas, not Happy Holidays, or, you know, that, that type of thing, that type of mindset. Of, it makes a difference what we say and how we say it and why we say it. Even outside of the friendly confines of the church buildings, the culture even discusses what Christmas is all about. And I've spoken my fair share of comments about Christmas and its observance in the culture. And I've also pointed out what I see as some inconsistencies between what God says about Christ and then what the culture says about Christmas. And those usually are two different things. But ironically enough, the scripture before us today speaks directly to the person of Jesus and who he really is. And we're going to have the opportunity in one week, one week from today, to celebrate the birth of this Messiah. So it seems only fitting that we would review what the Bible says about the one to whom we all owe our lives, all our worship, all our honor, all our glory. So let me read for you quickly uh, these eight verses in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. And the words will be on the screen for you to follow along if you like. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, I pray in this mighty name, Jesus, our Messiah, I pray that you would speak to us today very clearly. I pray that you would not allow us to be distracted or hindered from focusing on your word. And I pray that you would speak to us by your spirit. Help us understand. And I pray our perspectives and our mindsets would be altered or changed, even made more and more like yours as we consider the truth before us today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This message, oddly enough, only has two points. And so they're pretty self-explanatory, but I want to talk just a little bit briefly about what is being said here. The two points, if you'd like to take notes, here they are. Number one, Jesus saves. Pretty straightforward, right? Number one, Jesus saves. Number two, Jesus is God. Two fundamental truths about Christianity. Jesus saves and Jesus is God. So I want to just walk through the text and show you how that appears so clearly in Matthew's inspirational writing of this gospel. First of all, verses 18 to 21, that zeroes in on this truth about Jesus being our salvation. So Matthew, as you can see, as opposed to Luke, is a little bit more from Joseph's 
perspective. You know, you read the first two chapters of Luke and you see a lot about Mary and uh, her interaction with Elizabeth and all those things that went into that, uh, that event, those, those events of that time. But here you hear, uh, you see Mo, uh, Joseph being spoken to by the angel and you see this situation set up, almost the focus is that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. What does that mean? Does that mean they were engaged? They were dating? They were planning on getting married? No. Let me just tell you real quickly and very importantly why that's a big deal. In Jewish culture, this is the first stage of marriage. Okay, this is way more serious than what we would see as our engagement process. Way more serious. There were legal ramifications to this betrothal. It usually lasted about a year before the wedding night, and it was much more legal, much more binding. So when the Bible says that Mary was betrothed to Joseph, Joseph was already called her husband. Even though she was still living in her father's house and would be until the wedding day, he was already considered her husband. So why, why does that matter? Well, R.T. France wrote uh, a little bit about this. He said, in Jewish law, betrothal was much more than our engagement. It was a binding contract able to be terminated only by death. And th this is not the marriage. We're talking about betrothal. Terminated only by death or by a divorce, just like in a full marriage. The man was already the husband, but the woman remained in her father's house. The marriage was completed when the husband took the betrothed to his home in a public ceremony. And Leon Morris would add that a betrothed woman could be punished as an adulteress, which is why this is such a big deal. When Mary was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit, that's a problem, right? Because no one believed her initially. But here's the situation. Socially, culturally, what is, what is she to do? She's going to be disgraced. She's going to be excluded. Joseph has every right to do that. So the fact that the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, that's a, a very important detail. So Joseph, as I said, was already referred to her, as her husband. And he was a righteous man, the Bible says. He didn't want Mary to be disgraced, even though he had legal grounds. And by the way, that says something about perspectives on marriage, I believe, doesn't it? Joseph had an opportunity. He had options. But he chose to obey the angel of the Lord. Just something to ponder. Very interesting part of this story. So Joseph considered divorcing her secretly to prevent a scandal, to try to maintain her dignity. And, but then Joseph was visited in a dream by an angel of the Lord. Now, this is also, this interaction is interesting. The angel referred to Joseph as a son of David. You remember last week when we went through the genealogy? You remember who else was called a son of David? Son of Abraham, son of God, Jesus, the Messiah. That, that's important. So this legality was also mentioned in the genealogy. So the angel told Joseph, don't be afraid to continue his relationship with Mary. The angel revealed to Joseph that the child was of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the angel informed Joseph that Mary would have a son and Joseph would give him a specific name. Now I want to point out something in this particular verse. Matthew 121 is a crucial verse. The Bible says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You know what it really says? It's much more emphatic. The literal translation says, She will bear a son, you will call his name Jesus, for he himself will save his people from their sins. He himself will save his people from their sins. It doesn't mean that he will uh, set in motion a plan to save his people, that he will delegate the responsibility, but he will see to it that it's done. None of that. 
He Himself, He will be personally involved in the saving of His people. It also says that He will do this uh, a matter of fact. Um, he won't attempt. He won't um, hope that this happens. He will. He Himself will save His people from their sins. On this occasion, the name is not to be left to the discretion of the parents. That's also very important. This child is special. This child has a destiny that is to be expressed in the meaning of his name. In the case of Jesus, the Greek form of Joshua or Yeshua, common name, the sound sounds like Yeshua, he will save the origin of the name Yahweh is salvation. The sound, the meaning, everything about Jesus' name points us to this one fact. In Christ, there is salvation. Only in Christ, there is salvation. He Himself will save His people from their sins. Jesus saves. Period. Number two, Jesus is God. The last four verses here, 22 to 25. Matthew again, here we see that, that phrase again, right? Now all this happened to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. I want you to notice something in verse 22. This is also pretty significant. It doesn't say in verse 22 that this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. See that? What does the text say? Spoken by the Lord through the prophet. That's important. This is God's word. It's not man's word. It's God's word. And he quotes Isaiah 7.14. Wednesday night we went through several prophecies. All the prophecies really in Matthew's gospel that have fulfillment in the New Testament from the Old Testament. So the angel of the Lord explains all this clearly. While this was taking place, all this has happened. Everything about the birth of the Messiah was planned by God. This was not random. It was not arbitrary. And by the way, I'm going to just throw this out there. You can ponder it later on. Um, there's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as chance. Just file that away. You can sort it out later. There's no such thing as luck. I heard a, a funny saying that says, Luck is for the unprepared. Well, I, I would change that. Luck is for people who hadn't met Jesus. I don't need luck. I got the master of the universe. I don't need luck. And by the way, I didn't mean to say all this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, luck, chance, coincidence, all these things, these are culture's creations to keep God out of the picture. Hope you, hope you realize that. God, God is in control. He is almighty in every meaning of that word. So all this has happened because God said it. The circumstances surrounding the birth of the Messiah were foretold by prophets sent by God. The message of the prophets was the word of the Lord. They were simply being a mouthpiece for God. Spoken by the Lord through the prophet. So Matthew, in his gospel, takes this inspiration very seriously. This is God's word. So Isaiah 7.14 that's quoted is fulfilled not just in the naming of Jesus, but in this whole account of his origin and his naming. The point is not that Jesus ever bore Emmanuel as an actual name. So you see that in the text, right? Verse 23, uh, the quote from Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. They will call, shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now, this is, this is something I really want to, I, I kind of want to conclude on this. I can't, gosh, I cannot believe. Uh, am I talking fast? Uh, because it seems like I'm almost done and uh, I don't need to be done yet, but I am. Almost. Almost. Don't get used to it now. Don't, don't, don't get used to it. Verse 
Think about the name Emmanuel. This, this may set some people free this morning. What does Emmanuel mean? Translating. God with us, right? So I want you to think about this whole scenario. I want you to think about our condition, Jesus and His plan of redemption from the foundations of the world. And so, what, what does it mean for us? We are born with a curse. Sin. What does that mean? We're, we're separated from God. We are enemies Technically speaking, enemies of God. We need to be reconciled to God. Right? That's our deepest need. We need to be restored into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so how does that happen? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, was sent to this earth to take on human form, to live a sinless life, to die a sinner's death, to pay the penalty of our sin, our separation, to reconcile us to God, to bring us back into relationship with God by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, right? That's what reconciliation means. So grab hold of this name. Emmanuel, God with us. That is the definition of redemption and salvation. We, far from God, separated by our sin, Jesus Christ came and died on a cross and paid for our sins with His blood so that He might really, literally be God with us. That name means we have been brought back into relationship with God. If, if, if it weren't for Jesus, we couldn't have God with us. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus made it possible for God to be with us again. All because of the birth which ultimately led to the death and the resurrection. See, Christmas is not so much about that Christmas tree as it is about this Christmas tree. His birth was really all about His death and all about the resurrection. The completion of a redemptive plan that would bring us back to relationship with God. That's the only way we find forgiveness and reconciliation and eternal life. It's through Jesus. You will call His name Jesus because He will save His people from their sins. He Himself will save His people from their sins. So, Joseph is in this predicament. He has a visit from this angel. So, the Bible says that in verse 24, he got up. I love this, the literal translation. It says he awoke. But in, in the original uh, New Testament Greek it says, Joseph got up from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, took Mary as his wife. And then in verse 25, just to make sure there was no doubt in anyone's mind. Verse 25, literally, Translated says, he was not knowing her until she gave birth to a son. You know what? Now, why is that important? Why is it important? She's already with child by the Holy Spirit. But why is it important that Joseph, Joseph makes such a, 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 a major stand? Why would Joseph need to do that? He didn't want anybody... To confuse the truth, this child is divine. In other words, uh, it's almost like Joseph is um, on purpose, intentionally distancing himself to make sure everybody knows 
Mary is going to give birth to a child, but I'm not the father. Conceived by the Holy Ghost. This is, this is a divine act. This is a miracle. This is the birth of the Messiah. This is the Redeemer that would save His people from their sins. And then the final sentence. What did Joseph do? By way of obedience, he named the boy Jesus. Just as he had been instructed. Right? So, Jesus saves. Verse 23, Jesus is God, God with us. Michael Green wrote a commentary about this. Let me, let me read to you just one snippet of what he wrote. He says, so here, at the Annunciation of Jesus' birth, we are brought face to face with the central theme of the gospel. God, who's been at work on His people since the times of Abraham, has come among them now in person. And He's come for the specific purpose of rescuing them from the mess they've gotten themselves into. Christianity is not good advice about morals. It is good news about God and what He's done for us. It would be a pity if all these questions which arise in modern minds were to rob us of the main significance of this marvelous chapter. The Father loves us enough to send His Son, the one who shares both God's nature and ours. He comes to rescue His people from their sins, enemies far more deadly than, than Rome. If God loves like that, it is good news. Gospel indeed. So as we conclude this brief ending to chapter 1, we really need to, before we, before we finish, we need to really carefully look at the words used in verse 21. I know I've, I've kind of been a little repetitive about that one verse, but it's really that important. You'll give him the name Jesus because he himself will save his people from their sins. He himself will save his people from their sins. The angel doesn't say that he might save his people or even that he will give them the opportunity to be saved. He says that Jesus will save his people from their sins. Because we live on this side of history, we can look back to a hill called Mount Calvary. And we can say with full confidence that Jesus did save His people from their sins. When Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished. He didn't stutter. He meant it. He meant every word. So the question before us today is not whether Jesus actually accomplished His work he did. The question before us today is whether or not we are among those called His people. You, you understand what I'm asking? When you read verse 21, He Himself will save His people from their sins. So Jesus did His part. That's not the question. Are you among His people? Are you the His people that's in that verse? Does that describe you? Are you one of His people? Do you belong to Jesus? Have you repented of your sins? Have you trusted in Christ alone for forgiveness and eternal life? Can you say with confidence right now that the moment you breathe your last breath on this earth, you're going straight to heaven. Is, is that your confident declaration today? Because if it's not, then you're not one of His people. 
And let me, let me just make sure we all understand the consequence of that statement. If you have not repented of your sins, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ alone for forgiveness and salvation and eternal life, if you haven't surrendered to Jesus, then you do not belong to Him. And the consequence of that statement is that you are not the subject of verse 21. And that means you cannot confidently say that when you breathe your last breath on this earth, you're going straight to heaven. There's only one way to get to heaven. There's only one way to find forgiveness. One way of salvation. And it is by faith in Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he, is, he is calling out your name. He, he's almost, if you can say reverently, screaming. Pleading with you. Repent. Believe. The one who died in your place on the cross. He's calling you today. Repent. Believe the good news. He has furnished all the proof you could possibly want or need. And He's done everything necessary for your salvation. He, he's calling. So, what do I do? Well, I'll tell you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come home. Just, just say yes. Just surrender to Jesus. It's, it's, it's that simple. Trust in Christ. Let's pray.